the Whipple procedure, or as it's also known, the Whipple pancreatico duodenectomy, the Whipple pancreatico duodenectomy, which is just a term to describe that the pancreas and the duodenum are removed, among other things, in this operation, which is done mainly for tumors near the ampulla, which is situated around here in your body for reference. But let's zoom in. Now to orient you, I'll highlight that this big structure here is the liver. Into the liver you can see extensions of the bile duct that start here. So that's the bile duct. That extends into the liver and also has an outpouching here that's known as the gallbladder. And then also extends into the first part of the small intestine here where it releases bile to help digest food. The other structure that has a duct that communicates here is this yellow guy here that's known as the pancreas. The pancreatic duct will also extend and release pancreatic juice to help digest proteins and carbohydrates that we eat in our diet. And we'll communicate with the bile duct here at a point in the intestine that's called the ampulla, as I mentioned earlier. Now I'll give the names of the other structures around here. So this guy up here is the stomach. That extends down here to the first part of the small intestine that's known as the duodenum the duodenum, which, as you might recall from the name of this procedure, we're removing the pancreas and the duodenum, among other things I'll highlight. And again, stemming back to the reason why we do this operation is if there's some type of tumor that obstructs or is near the ampulla. So that can involve a tumor of the bile duct, that could be a tumor of the duodenum, or it could be a tumor of the head of the pancreas, the top part right here, that's nearest to the ampulla. And there are also circumstances where the ampulla itself could have a tumor that closes off this opening. Now, as long as the tumor that has grown in this region has not spread distantly or metastasized far away, you can perform a Whipple procedure to help remove the involved organs. So let me remove the parts of this drawing that would be removed in the Whipple procedure. So as you can see, the liver, bile duct, stomach, and pancreas still remain here, but we've lost the duodenum, we've lost the head of the pancreas, we've lost the gallbladder, and the lower parts of the biliary tree or the bile duct here that went into the ampulla, as well as the entire ampulla itself. And this is what someone would look like if we stopped partway through the Whipple procedure. The next part though would involve connecting a loop of intestine to the pancreas and the bile duct as I've shown here, which would also come up and connect to the remnant of the stomach. So we would use tiny sutures to sew together this new connection between the stomach and this later part of the small intestine that's known as the jejunum. So I'll call it the jejunum. And we would also have these tiny sutures connecting the jejunum to the pancreas as well as the jejunum to the bile duct here. These new connections have special names as well. The connection between the stomach and the jejunum is known as a gastrojejunostomy or a GJ anastomosis, so we'll just call it GJ. The connection between the pancreas and the jejunum is a PJ, so a pancreatico jejunostomy. And then the connection between the bile duct that's in the liver to the jejunum is called a hepatico jejunostomy, or we'll just call it an HJ. So at the end of the operation, this is what the organs would look like. In addition to this, drains are left in to make sure we can identify if there's a leak of some sort. These drains extend outside of the body. We have one drain on the right side of the belly, near where the liver is, the hepaticojejunostomy, the pancreaticojejunostomy, these two new connections. And there's also one back here, next to the new connection between the stomach and the jejunum. And this also extends outside of the body and can be removed before the patient goes home from their hospital stay. Now this whole operation takes anywhere from four to six hours to complete. The benefit of this operation is that it's the best chance of curing a tumor that occurs near the ampulla. But like any operation, there are risks associated with it. And I'll write this off to the side here, so there are risks. The first risk would be a leak at any of the new connections that we've made. And I'll highlight a leak with this little asterisk. The most common leak we see is the PJ leak. That occurs more often than the leak between the bile duct and the jejunum, and very rarely we can see a leak from the stomach and jejunum connection. And again, the purpose of leaving these drains is to help us identify and control the leak so that the fluid that comes out from the pancreas, or effectively the pancreatic juice in a PJ leak, doesn't sit around in the belly and is instead controlled because of the presence of a drain. The other complication we see is delayed 
awakening of the stomach. It's also known as delayed gastric emptying. In either of these circumstances, the patient's hospital stay would be prolonged as we would control the leak or we would ensure that the stomach would wake up on time to allow the rest of the GI tract to function properly. Now the Whipple procedure is a big operation and so there are complications that are inherent to any big operation. These can include the formation of blood clots. These clots can occur in your legs that can cause what's referred to as a deep venous thrombosis. They can go to your lung which is known as a pulmonary embolism or they can go to your heart that can cause a myocardial infarction or heart attack. Other risks associated with big operations include pneumonia or a urinary tract infection or UTI. Now following the operation there are anticipated steps in post-operative or post-op recovery. Firstly you should expect not to be eating or to have nothing by mouth or be NPO for the first one to two days as we allow these new connections in your GI tract to heal. Once the GI tract has been waking up, we'll advance the diet slowly, first with liquids, and then we would advance to solid food. The other component of post-operative recovery is pain control, which would often begin with something like an epidural or IV pain medication. And these would be transitioned to oral pain medication before the patient is discharged. And then finally, the next step of one's care would be determined by the pathology of the specimen removed in the operation. The pathology report often returns by the end of the patient's stay in the hospital, which is just over a week. This can either be discussed by the day of discharge or more commonly on the first follow-up appointment in clinic.